Reasonable Doubt by Joseph Law Part 1. The Conversation Walter walked into the room and plopped the newspaper onto the counter. It was the same news as usual. Another murder, another raping. That's life. These things happened before he was around, and they would happen after he passed away. Years ago, his parents were overjoyed when he told them that he wanted to go to law school. They were thinking about the money and the prestige, but Walter actually wanted to make a difference in the world. He walked over to the bathroom to take the usual orange-bottled medications before dinner. He closed the door. He stood in front of the mirror, looking at the face of an old man. This was an old man that had dreams of changing the world when he was a youth. Now he realized that his job was something like a custodian or a janitor in a junkyard. You can clean up a little bit, think positively, and tell yourself that you're making a difference. But he couldn't avoid reality. That big pile of garbage, those horrible headlines every day in the newspapers, were still there right in front of his face every day. It was overwhelming, and it was saddening. The phone rang. Hello? Walter! Jeff! Of course, Walter had forgotten. He had dinner plans with his sudden law to be. We still on for tonight? Of course. I can pick you up in about 15 minutes. Is that okay? They both ordered the usual Reuben sandwiches, and then there was a silence as soon as the waiter left. So, Walter began... Anything new in the works? Well, Jeff began shifting in his seat and Walter squinted his eyes. You do have something. Jeff smiled nervously. Something big? The semi-weekly dinners had become a bore lately. Months ago, Anita, Walter's daughter, twisted his arm into meeting Jeff. Walter wanted Anita to find someone for years. Anita was 30, and Walter wasn't expected to live beyond a few more years because of a heart condition. He wanted to see his daughter's wedding before he kicked the bucket. Dad, you'll like him. What's wrong with all the guys I introduced you to? There's nothing wrong with him, Dad, and there's nothing wrong with Jeff. You'll like him. He's intelligent, and he's a successful writer. Walter laughed. There's nothing worse than hearing your daughter say that she's fallen for an aspiring writer. Walter said it with a smile. He's not aspiring. He's already published and he's made over a million from his first book. That's not exactly a starving artist. He makes more than some of your lawyer friends. You'll find him interesting, I'm sure. It's not just about the money, Anita. You know that. It's about integrity, integrity above all else. You can carve that onto my gravestone. Dad, you know I don't want you talking that way. He didn't talk that way before. Of course, Walter eventually did meet Jeff and did find him very interesting. They began meeting regularly over Reuben sandwiches. Jeff had written a book about the dangers of technology. It was hardly a new topic to write about, but his book soared to the top of the bestseller lists. You do have something. Jeff smiled nervously. Something big? Jeff leaned forward. AICU, what do you think about it? Walter shrugged. Just because I'm old doesn't mean I'm against technology, Jeff. Those AI crime units are great. Are you so sure about that? Walter huffed. When I was your age, everyone was up in arms about driverless cars. People didn't trust them. But the statistics showed that they were better than human drivers. People got used to the idea. And now thousands of lives have been saved on the roads. And AI crime units? You think it's the same? Saving lives? Sure. But how can you be so sure? They work differently from driverless cars. With car accidents, you can count the bodies. The AICUs are designed to convict. It's keeping dangerous people off the streets. Sure, a couple of innocent people will be accidentally convicted, but that happened before, too. 
when a man's fate was decided by a jury? The only difference is that AI can't be biased and it's data-driven to make a better decision. Walter took a sip of water before continuing. And the AI just keep getting better at what they're doing. They disposed of our constitutional right to a jury just like that, Jeff snapped his fingers. And they repealed prohibition in the early 1900s. So what? I know it's a big deal to change a law like that, but times change and everyone knows AICU trials are better than jury trials. There are still a lot of people out there that don't trust AICU and want humans to decide their fate. Some say that humans have a gut instinct that these bots don't have. Only the guilty ones want a human jury. Trust me, as a lawyer, I'd know. Anyway, what's your point with all this? Jeff straightened up in his chair and took a deep breath. I was back in Jersey last week, and I met some friends and family, and I told them about Anita, and all they wanted to know. Jeff paused and took a deep breath. And? Jeff took a sip of water and then leaned in and spoke with his hands gesturing out. And all they wanted to know was what my next book was going to be about. Walter rested his head on his fist. I know. Jeff continued, it's ridiculous, most important woman of my life, and instead they just want to know what you want to know every time we get together. What's my idea for my next work? But here's the thing, in annoyance, I just started spitballing off the top of my head and I, I, I got it. I figured out the idea for my next book. Okay, Walter grunted. Walter. I want you to be my lawyer. Your lawyer? For what? You know I don't do lawsuits or anything like that. I'm strictly a criminal lawyer. Yes, I know. I want you to be my defense, to to fight to prove my innocence. Innocence? Innocence from what? From murder. Walter squinted his eyes and sat straight up as the waiter arrived with the Reuben sandwiches. Oh, sorry, Jeff said to the waiter as the sandwich was placed in front of him. Could you cut it in half? The waiter gave Jeff a dry look. I know it's a bit silly and uh, I'm sure it won't be too much trouble, but it does make a difference for me. You got a fork and knife set right there, the annoyed waiter replied. Jeff sighed. That's barely better than a butter knife, but... uh, I suppose you could just bring me a steak knife, and I could cut it myself. Jeff looked to Walter. Here they got these huge steak knives when you order a steak. I don't know if you've seen... Uh, Why don't you just please cut the sandwich in half and bring it back? Walter interrupted, addressing the waiter. The waiter disappeared with the sandwich. (laughs) Thank you, Jeff continued. Ah, Now, where was I? You murdering someone? I believe that's what you were talking about, Walter said, very annoyed. Jeff smiled. (laughs) I guess. He laughed a little. I mean, no. He chuckled again. Not exactly murder, Walter. Not exactly. Jeff took another slow, nervous breath. No, not exactly. Jeff took a sip of water. I want you to help me to frame myself for murder and help me have the AI wrongly convict me. Once I'm convicted, you step forward with the proof of my innocence locked away and Jeff snapped his fingers. Then there's the material for my next best-selling book and there's your chance to make a difference as a lawyer and get people talking about how much we should be trusting our fates to these algorithms. Walter crossed his arms skeptically. How exactly do you plan to get framed for a murder that doesn't really happen? (laughs) Oh, well, we'll wait for a real murder to happen, and then we'll plant all the evidence. I doubt we'll have to wait long for the right candidate murder. The good thing is that these kind of suspectless murders happen all the time. He took another sip of water. 
Walter was still sternly looking at him with his arms crossed. Perhaps good wasn't the right term to use. Excuse me, he said and took a large bite out of the center of his sandwich. Part 2. The Headline How did the appointment go? Anita asked her father over FaceTime. The doctor said the same thing as usual. Get lots of sleep, fresh air, and exercise, but nothing that changes the fact that my heart is a ticking time bomb that could go off at any minute, if you know what I mean, Walter scoffed. How about you? How are things at the hospital? Busy day today? Anita was slow to reply. Walter then realized that she was fighting back tears. Was she finally coming to terms with the fact that she would soon lose her father? Sweetie, what is it? Did you lose someone under your care today? Not exactly. Well, what was it? After a few minutes of talking, Anita finally came to the point. I gave someone a blood transfusion. Okay, Walter continued, confused. So what? Oh, they were religiously against it, but I administered it without their consent. Walter fell silent. Did you break a law? Are you going to be sued? I can defend you, sweetie. Anita sniffled. Yes, I did break a law, but no, I won't be in any sort of legal danger. I... I did it without the patient knowing. I was convinced she would die if I didn't give it to her. And you are probably right. She said she would have rather died than taken a blood transfusion. I don't know, Dad. I think I've done something wrong. I think I crossed the line today. Walter sighed and covered his face for a second. You listen to me, sweetie. You did the right thing. There are a lot of people out there with a lot of weird ideas. Sometimes we even have to protect people from their own ideas if it's for the greater good. Anita said finishing the sentence she heard from him all her life. Walter sighed and there was an uneasy long silence. He had really hoped to talk to Anita about Jeff, to tell her about his crazy murder framing idea. He wasn't sure how the conversation would go or even how he wanted to spin it. Did he want to use this as evidence that her fiancé was a crazy person or use it as evidence that he was a brilliant, ambitious man? Walter figured Anita likely knew that there was a fine line between the two sorts of people, and it may have been what attracted her to him in the first place. How are the new hospital AI units working out? Walter asked, changing the subject. Anita forced a smile and wiped the tears on her face with her palm. The data came in yesterday. Hospital fatalities are down by 20% since the units were put into place three months ago. Walter quickly sat up straight. That's wonderful news. Why didn't you lead with that? Anita sighed. My algorithms aren't perfect yet. They say they want to work out the kinks before they give the approval to pass the tech on to other hospitals. With all this anti-AI sentiment that's getting popular, I wonder if the project will fall through. She laughed at herself. <laughs> Jeff wrote a book that fed to people's fear of these things. I guess I'm marrying the enemy. What Anita said made Walter think about Jeff and his ideas of faulty AI in the field of crime. What was worse? An innocent man convicted because of a wrong jury verdict? or one convicted because of a wrong AICU calculation. Somehow, the latter felt much worse. If that innocent man was later acquitted, there wouldn't be anyone to feel guilty for taking away years of that man's life. There would be no one to be outraged into changing the system like Jeff was. There would be no feeling of remorse at all from a cold set of lifeless equations. Anita, I'm sorry about today, but please remember what I said about integrity. You want it on your gravestone, I know, Anita said sarcastically. But Dad, what does that word even mean? It means doing what you feel in your heart is the right thing, no matter what the cost, Walter replied with a passion. Anita thought deeply about what her father said. 
She looked at him in the eyes and smiled. A few weeks after the conversation over Reuben sandwiches, Jeff was knocking at Walter's door. Jeff barged in. Look at this. Jeff pointed to a headline. This fits perfectly. Walter took the digital newspaper into his hands. He read the headline. Woman and child found dead. Foul play not ruled out. Tell me your plan, Walter demanded. You and I drive down to the scene of the crime. I get out, walk around. I place my hands on the railings. There are railings there? Sure there are. I drive by that spot every week. Anyway, I get my prints on the railings, scratch my head, and make sure plenty of hair falls in for the DNA sweepers. I'll even walk over the railing to the spot of the crime. There's enough information in the newspaper to know the exact spot. Okay, so you leave a load of biological evidence there. But what's your alibi going to be? You know, the truth that you want them to believe is a lie? Simple. I'll say that I always drive by that spot, which is true. And I'll say that this time I wanted to see the site of the actual crime that I read about in the newspaper. So I hopped over the rail and checked it out. Sounds like a stupid thing to do. Sure. But the penalty for that stupidity shouldn't be death. That's the whole point. Walter hesitated and then reluctantly nodded his head. When did this murder happen? Last night. And if we go today and place all that circumstantial evidence, won't the AIs be smart enough to know that you were there after the crime was committed? They've already collected the body and done a preliminary sweep of the crime scene, no doubt. They'll do a secondary sweep of the area. You're a criminal lawyer. You know that standard procedure. Then you know that the secondary sweep hardly ever overturns information in the primary sweep. If we go today and get my biological information all over the crime scene, I'm convinced the secondary sweep will collect enough data to convict me as the murderer. So you're hoping that the secondary sweep will get the evidence to convict you because there wouldn't be enough from the first sweep to point to any specific suspect? I think that's a bit of an oversimplification, but you get the general idea. Jeff poured the whiskey over ice into two glasses. It sounds like you're more sold on the idea than before. Walter couldn't deny that this was a good opportunity. When he was younger, he might have agreed to this plan right away. Maybe it was a mistake to hand over the conviction process to AICU. If it was a mistake, Walter couldn't change the law without a someone who could generate the public support necessary to change it. Jeff. Let's review from start to finish, Walter said and took a large swig of his drink. We found a headline that fits the idea you had weeks ago. So now we drive up to the scene and place your biological information all over so that you'll pop up on the AICU's second sweep of the area. We wait until you're convicted and likely sentenced to... It would be death in this scenario, I believe. I'd wait until you were sentenced to death. That in itself would generate a lot of buzz since you're a famous writer. But then, I'll come forward with information that the evidence the AICU used for your conviction was all fabricated. You get released, write about it. Best case scenario, we can get AICU convictions re-examined or even completely repealed. Worst case scenario, I get thrown in jail for making a joke out of the court system. Or at the very least, lose my license. Jeff took a deep breath. Walter, Jeff cleared his throat, with all due respect, with you as my father-in-law to be, you're talking like a man who isn't going to lose everything anyway. You only have a year more to live. Why not make a name for yourself before you... I'd be careful how you finish that sentence, Walter snapped. Jeff raised his hands in defeat. Walter, let me write a bestseller... And keep your daughter living in luxury for years from the money I make off of it after you're gone. Walter loved Anita more than anything. But before she came into his life, 
He was in love with the idea of doing something to change the legal system. Something more lasting than the janitor-like lawyer work of cleaning up a mess so he could get messy again. That's what he'd been doing his whole life. Now, in his final year on Earth, an opportunity had dropped into his lap. But there was something more, and it baffled Walter that Jeff couldn't see it. Perhaps Jeff was too in love with the best-case scenarios to see what the worst case that could happen really was. Walter's role was to come forward and prove Jeff's innocence eventually. But, in the meantime, Anita could possibly, maybe likely, call off an engagement with a suspected murderer. She might even suspect his guilt. This was a way to get Jeff out of their life. But... Was that what Walter really wanted? Did he want to spend the last moments of his life ruining Anita's chance at happiness? Finish up, Walter, Jeff said, and took the last swig of his whiskey. We need to get going. Now? The sooner the better, Jeff glanced at his watch. The second sweep could happen within hours. I wish you would have told me that before you served me my whiskey. You still do manual driving? Walter had already grabbed the keys to the car and was out the door. As they sped to the crime scene in the car, it occurred to Walter that there was yet another possible outcome to this plan. Walter could allow Jeff to get convicted and never come forward with the truth. No, Jeff entrusted that power into Walter's hands. But why would he betray that trust? Walter shook the evil thought from his head and clutched his sweaty palms to the steering wheel harder. Part 3. The Verdict The judge looked at Jeff sternly. One last time, and for the record before sentencing, how do you plea, Mr. Jeffrey Wright? Jeff leaned in gently toward the microphone with a nervous smirk. Not guilty, Your Honor. The judge sighed deeply without breaking eye contact. Jeff glanced over at Walter, who was sweating from his brow and was staring straight ahead. The bailiff handed the tablet over to the judge with the AICU verdict. All rise for the reading of the verdict, the judge casually announced after glancing at what the tablet said. Walter, Jeff, and the spectators rose to their feet. Jeff suddenly heard sobbing. He turned around to see Anita with her head in her hands. Jeff stepped over the railing as Walter shut the door to the car. Be careful where you step. I'll be sure to snag my clothes on the thorns and get my shoe residue in this mud, but if they catch anything from you here, the plan is ruined. Walter crossed his arms and leaned back against the car. Jeff, Walter started. Yes, Jeff replied without looking back. Do you love my daughter? Jeff looked back. What? My daughter, Anita, do you love her? Jeff sighed. Yes, I do. Walter nodded. Do you love her more than you love being a writer? I don't see why I can't love both. But if you had to choose... Jeff shook his head, turned around, and started to walk away. I was asking you a question, Walter shouted. Jeff stopped in his tracks. Couldn't you have picked a better time? I need to get this done. No, I want to know now. Jeff turned around and looked at Walter again. Walter, Jeff started and brushed his hands against each other. What kind of writer do you think I am? A romance novelist that fills people's heads with silly ideas so I can make a profit? I write to change. I write about what I think are the issues in this world. And you know what? When I write, people actually read what I write. I can make a difference by planting seeds of thought into people's minds. I get people to think, what if? What if the way we've been doing things is wrong? I don't think there's a more important question out there that a human can ask. I try to get their head out of whatever prison they're in so they can ask that question. Jeff took a step towards Walter. So, 
If you're asking if I love your daughter more than doing what I think is the right thing to do, then I'm afraid the answer is no. I love her, but not that much. Walter took a deep breath and nodded. I used to be a young man who thought like you. That was a long time ago. Another silence. Okay, Jeff said finally. So what? So, I suppose there's still time enough to change. What? Walter shook his head. Don't you have a job to do, Walter grunted. Jeff nodded, turned away, and headed back into the brush. Jeff stood there in the courtroom, looking at Anita, sobbing in her hands, and then the verdict was read. Guilty. Jeff took a deep breath and looked over to Walter, waiting for him to speak up. The judge continued to read the details of the sentencing. The sentence was death. Any moment now would be a good time to speak up, Jeff thought. Walter remained silent and didn't look at Jeff at all. When the sentencing was through, Walter turned and walked out of the courtroom. Jeff furrowed his eyebrows. Come on, a police officer quietly but gruffly said to Jeff and grabbed him by his right arm. Jeff quietly followed his eyebrows still furrowed. Hours later, he was sitting in a jail cell. He sat there alone in the dark metal cell, his eyes darting nervously from side to side. Walter exited the Hall of Justice, loosened his tie, and hopped into his car. He opened the top to the convertible. Whoa, a man passing by with a scruffy beard and tattoos up his arm said to him, That's a 67 Shelby. I didn't know they made a convertible model. Walter started the car and made the engine roar. That's... that's not an electric converted? Is that even legal? Legal? I'm not even sure what that word means anymore, Walter grunted and hit the accelerator. He manually drives too, the man said to himself as the car took off. What? The man's girlfriend said to him, now returning from the convenience store. That old man there, he's actually driving that car instead of using AI. Walter shoved the rapper Jay-Z's first profanity-glutted album into the CD player and started blasting the music as the car roared up the curving hills. He used to listen to this album a lot when he was in law school years ago, misguidedly thinking that, misguidedly thinking that to help those from the streets, he had to listen to their music, etc., He didn't agree with the message of the songs, but he didn't care right now. It felt good. The wind in his hair felt good, too. He felt young for a moment. He looked down at the speedometer. 87 miles an hour. Okay. Too fast, he thought, and took his foot off the gas. The speed didn't change. In fact, he watched as the speedometer went up to 90 miles an hour. What? he said to himself and turned the music off. He would have guessed that it was because he was coasting if it weren't for the fact that he was heading uphill. He slowly stepped on the brakes. No response. He pressed the brake pedal all the way to the floor. No response. There was a real curve coming up now. The speedometer read 95 miles an hour. What's going on? He watched as the steering wheel slowly, gently turned the car with the curve until the road was straight again. The car was in driverless mode. But how? Walter had the mode deactivated completely before finishing purchasing the car from the collector he bought it from. Another turn was coming up. Once again, the steering wheel began to slowly, gently adjust to the dangerous rail curve. Walter breathed a sigh of relief. He wondered, how could it be... Bang! Before Walter realized it, the car made a sharp, sudden turn away from the railing and a sharp turn back toward it. Walter instinctually grabbed the steering wheel and pulled back in the opposite direction at the last moment. If he hadn't done so, the car would have broken completely through the railing instead of just banging into it, and he would have gone over the cliff. Walter gripped the steering wheel closely as the next turn approached. 
He drifted to the left and felt the steering wheel violently tugging against his hands. The car screeched against the road, and Walter's body was tossed from side to side. Walter glanced up to see a huge truck barreling down the hill. The steering wheel jerked once again. Bang! When the cleanup crew arrived, all that remained of the car and Walter were crumpled up pieces. Dead man walking. One of the fellow death row inmates shouted to Jeff as two guards escorted him toward the cylindrical glass gas chamber. Jeff hung his head as he approached the executioner. Do you have anything to say? Same thing you probably hear all the time, Jeff said. I'm innocent. The executioner scoffed. I hear people say they're innocent all the time, but I don't hear them making up crazy stories like you do. But then again, that's what you did for a living, wasn't it? Write stories? The tall man stooped down to put his face right in front of Jeff. Jeff looked up at his sunken dark eyes. Let me tell you something, the executioner continued. Let's say your story is true, and you had your conviction faked to take down the system. What about those two people? They're still dead, and the real murderers are out there, and will probably go unpunished because of your interference. You didn't think of that, did you? In fact, the real murderer may be out there waiting to harm someone else. The way I see it, I hope you are lying. Because if you're telling the truth, we're worse off. Either way, the world will be glad to get rid of you. There was a buzzing sound. The executioner sighed in frustration. You're entitled to a visitor. I waive my rights to a visitor, Jeff replied, hanging his head again. You have a visitor, the executioner continued. He droned on about his right to have a visitor that his family or a close friend to witness the execution. Since the execution could not be overturned at this point, he would be allowed his right to total privacy without any surveillance for his last moment with his loved one. Jeff was escorted into the interior execution cylinder, and his visitor entered the private, blacked-out exterior cylinder. Jeff placed his hands on the glass. Anita! Hello, Jeff, Anita replied with tear-filled eyes. Jeff hadn't seen Anita since that day in court. He'd always assumed that after the verdict she... Anita, listen, I guess we don't have much time and I guess not much matters now, but there's just one thing I need to know. Do you believe I really killed those people? Do you believe it? A tear ran down Anita's cheek and she shook her head. I believe you're innocent, Anita said and forced a smile. Jeff sighed. That's all that matters to me now, he sighed again. I... Just don't get how your father died the day of the verdict. It can't be coincidence. If only he would have said the truth right then. Jeff rubbed the bridge of his nose. Someone like your dad, he, he would have at least shared that information with someone. Especially with the state of health he was in. He knew something could happen to him at any moment. Anita wiped another tear from her eye. Maybe my father didn't say anything because he wanted news of the verdict to get out first. Maybe he wanted to wait a few weeks until there was lots of public attention and then reveal the truth. Jeff slowly paced in a circle in the glass chamber and then came near Anita again. I guess that makes sense. Jeff looked down to the ground and tilted his head slightly to the side. Come to think of it, Jeff continued. I think I remember telling him to do that. Is that so? Anita said coldly. A chill ran down Jeff's spine as he realized the truth. Your father did share the information of his plan with someone, didn't he? Someone he could trust. But why wouldn't that person come forward once your father died? Why? Jeff banged on the glass suddenly and violently. Why, Anita? Why? 
Anita's face turned stone cold. Ever since you've been convicted, anti-AI sentiment is at an all-time low. The systems that I designed for hospitals will be implemented nationwide in a matter of weeks because of that climate. Thousands of lives will be saved. So you'd sacrifice, no, murder your own father and fiancé to ensure that? Anita brushed the tears off of both cheeks with her hands, smearing her mascara. My father told me about the plan. It was the hardest thing I have ever done. But I reconnected and programmed the AI in his car to kill him that day. All I had to do was keep silent and wait. That day in court was the hardest day of my life, not because of the verdict, but because of what I had done. I can't believe it. I can't. You and my father are more alike than you realize, you know. He told me once about how you said you love what's right more than me. Jeff backed away from the glass. Anita shook her head. My father always told me, we have to do what is right for the greater good. I always had trouble agreeing with him. I still do. But he was right. You were both right. This must have been how the Lord felt, Anita muttered. What? Jeff retorted in surprise and annoyance. Oh, that's... Anita waved her hand in the air once. Long story. I felt bad about it, what I did to this Jehovah's Witness girl once. I forced a blood transfusion on her. So I went to a church and told them about it and asked for forgiveness. They said I did the right thing by making the small sacrifice of my feelings to save that girl's life. They said that when the Lord gave up his son, he sacrificed just one person to save many. They told me that I should always do what I felt in my heart was the right thing to do, no matter what. <laughs> Sounded a lot like my father. You're crazy, Jeff said in disbelief. Anita slowly shook her head. Goodbye, Jeff. I love you. I always loved you. Really, Anita said and walked towards the exit. White gas began to fill the execution cylinder. Anita, Jeff shouted while banging on the inside of the chamber. You can end this now, he shouted at the top of his lungs. One year later, a woman approached two gravestones that were side by side. She placed flowers on both graves as the snow lightly fell. I know you're looking down on me, Dad. And I know you're proud, she said. Her gloved hand gently grazed over the gravestone inscription. Walter Tom Garrett. He was a man of integrity above all else. This was a reading of Reasonable Doubt by Joseph Law, based on the scripture Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is more treacherous than anything else and is desperate. Who can know it? Thanks for listening.